At the 44th Annual Academy Awards, there were three films with eight nominations each, Fiddler on the Roof, The French Connection, and The Last Picture Show. Only one would win five statuettes. And the winner is... The winner is... The winner is... The winner is the French Connection, Philip D'Antonio producer. The winner is Ernest Tideman. Jerry Greenberg for the French Connection. The winner is William Friedkin. The winner is Mr. Gene Hackman. Surprise? No, I'm not surprised at the amount of nominations. The only thing I'm surprised at that we won. Philip D'Antoni, the producer of The French Connection, whose name had just been mispronounced by presenter Jack Nicholson. D'Antoni's film was up against distinguished competition, including A Clockwork Orange and Sunday Bloody Sunday. William Friedkin's fellow nominees for Best Director were Peter Bogdanovich, Stanley Kubrick, Norman Jewison, and John Schlesinger. That's right. That was that year, wasn't it? In a way, it was surprising, and in a way, it sort of seemed to fit into that new Hollywood that was just erupting at that time. Film critics David Thompson and Larushka Ivan Zadeh. It is a great period. Although you'd had Midnight Cowboy, which had been celebrated a couple of years earlier, it wasn't until the 72 Awards, I feel, that you really felt that the new Hollywood had become this new establishment. And when you look at the likes of McCabe and Mrs. Miller and Carnal Knowledge, it seemed to slot right in. It was the beginnings of a five-year period, let's say. We're just coming up to the Godfather films and the conversation, Gene Hackman again. Chinatown, Taxi Driver, all of those films really are made by 76, I think. And it was a rich time in American film. It really was a year of change, simultaneously looking back and forward. Charlie Chaplin, who had won an honorary Oscar at the very first awards in 1929, now accepted another and received the longest standing ovation in the history of the Academy. In contrast, The French Connection was the first movie rated R to win Best Picture, two years after Midnight Cowboy had been the first X. Hollywood was in transition, and in a moment like that, you can't tell whether your movie is going to be acclaimed as part of a new age. That's true whether you're the director or the producer or a craftsman, like Best Sound nominee Chris Newman. I don't think anybody knew what they had, and I think given the release date and the kind of vacuum into which the film was released, no one could have predicted the success of that film. When we wrapped the picture on the last day of shooting, Phil said to me, what do you think? And I said, Phil, I think we're going to be all right with this. I I think I'll get away with it. But we're not going to win any Academy Awards. I'll tell you that. When Billy said, what do you think? Just before we opened, I said, I think we have a minor classic, I said. But I did use the word minor. Philip D'Antoni, and before him, director William Friedkin, speaking here in 1999. Few filmmakers would have gone looking for a movie about hard-nosed cops whose behavior is only justified because they are fighting drug dealers in a socially disintegrating New York City. No, producer D'Antoni did not come to the French Connection. It came to him. I was also the producer of a movie called Bullet, Starring Steve McQueen and directed by Peter Yates. Which was a big success in 1967. Therefore, I was bombarded with many books and scripts from all the theatrical agents. And an agent kept trying to give me a book which hasn't been published yet, but was due to be published, called The French Connection. Written by Robin Moore, about New York detectives Eddie Egan and Sonny Grosso, who in the winter of 1961-62 uncovered the world's largest heroin network. I didn't seem to have too much interest in it, and I more or less passed on it for a couple of months. But his constantly bringing it up to me caused me to finally say, OK, I'm going to read it, and I read it and loved it. Once he optioned the book, D'Antoni needed a director with the proper perspective to film this story. At the time, I knew a young director called Bill Freakin. Bill and I met in a gym at Paramount Pictures. In the steam room at Paramount and said, I got this project and I think you'd be great for it. I thought he'd be great for it because he just seemed to have the right fresh attitude and a documentary background that I thought would be very good for this kind of a film. The picture was not set up at any studio, but he invited me to come to New York with him to meet Egan and Grasso. 
And then they told me about the case, and I thought, yeah, this would make a great movie. Eddie Egan and Sonny Grasso were the two detectives at the center of the book. Their partnership drives the narrative as much as the story itself. When they met with Friedkin and D'Antoni, both of them were still serving officers, Egan a maverick, and Grosso his restraining force. Egan has passed away, but Grosso still clearly remembers him. Egan was the balloon, and I was the guy holding the string. He was afraid of no one and nothing. Didn't matter to him. Good side or bad side. He wasn't afraid of the wise guys. He wasn't afraid of the judges. He wasn't afraid of the bosses on the job. And, of course, the strictures and the rules that we have to go through, he was very well aware of that. But he would stretch them all the time. He would push it further and further. But we led the city in arrest year after year. You can't not pay attention to that, you know? Grosso and Egan's role on the movie cannot be overstated. Not only were they the actual subjects of the film, they were credited as technical consultants and given acting parts, Egan as the police chief and Grosso as a fellow cop. But when the French connection was being prepared, their role was even more crucial, to show producer D'Antoni and director Friedkin what life on the streets of New York was actually like. Billy and I spent at least four to five weeks doing research with Eddie Egan and Sonny Grasso. We used to go hit a bar with them on the outside looking in. I thought that their approach to law enforcement was just the absolute right touch for the time. It was like a game to them. The next time we'd hit that bar, or any bar, we would go in with them, them and us. We were with them while they made these busts, so we got first-hand knowledge of how it went down. The next bar we hit, we let them go in by themselves, and we'd be looking in through the mirror. I guess they wanted to show me what the world was like. And they loved it. D'Antoni and Friedkin fed these experiences into the final script by Ernest Tidyman. But nothing could be done if the money to film it wasn't forthcoming. It was always difficult raising money. All of the scripts went around to every studio in Hollywood that passed on the film... So most of them passed twice. The project basically was hanging around for two or three years, and finally 20th Century Fox decided that they were going to go back into the motion picture business. They were out of it for a year or two, financially speaking. And Dick Zanuck liked the project, said, can you get it ready in six weeks? <laughs> Phil and I were sitting in front of his desk, and he said, I got a million and a half dollars hidden away in a drawer over here. If you guys can make this film for that, go ahead. Freaking freaked out. <laughs> we, of course, said yes, and that was basically how it started. The next problem was, who do we cast as Popeye Doyle? Popeye Doyle is the name given to the fictionalized Eddie Egan. The casting process is something that always fascinates critics, not least Larushka Ivan Zadeh and David Thompson. The interesting thing is that Hackman was far from first choice. Friedkin got lucky with <laughs> Gene Hackman. Yeah, I mean, he didn't want Gene Hackman, did he? He didn't want him in the role. And yet he sees casting as the most important thing of any film that he makes. There are several people that have been talked about. Jackie Gleason was in mind. Robert Mitchum was in mind. There were various actors that you talk about. William Friedkin wanted Paul Newman. Now, if you recast that film in your mind with Paul Newman, immediately Popeye becomes so much more likable, so much more charming. They were talked about. It's like you say, wouldn't it be nice if? But we never really talked to them specifically about the part. But basically it came down to Gene Hackman because Gene was available. I was lucky if I fell into a kind of a category where I was somewhat unknown to an audience, but I was known in the business. I kind of satisfied a kind of a happy medium for the studio. We had a meeting with Gene, and he was all duded up. He had a little mustache, the exact opposite of what we thought Popeye Doyle should be looking like. But he's an actor. I was all in favor for him. Billy was a little undecided. I was not going to approve Gene Hackman. And Phil said, we have to, or we're going to lose the movie. I said, Phil, you want to do this with Hackman? I don't believe in it, but... I'll do it with you. We'll give it our best shot. It's interesting. There's no 
love interest as such. And yet there is a, I don't know how to describe it, but there's a very weird seductive relationship between Popeye and Frog One, the Frenchman, played so wonderfully by Fernando Ray. Fernando Ray, as the French drug kingpin, was the second happy casting accident of the French connection. <laughs> well, that was a great story. Billy said, I love this guy, and he mentioned the French movie that he had seen him in. Let's get that French guy that was in Belle de Jour. What the hell's his name? And he said, I'll find out. I went over to Paris and interviewed Fernando Ray and interviewed Marcel Bozuffi and decided those were the two guys that Billy had settled on. I went down to the airport to pick up Fernando Ray, who was just arriving. And there's this guy standing there who I did, in fact, recognize, but he was clearly not the guy I was thinking of. He says, hello, I am Fernando Ray. He says, you know, I'm not French, I'm Spanish. I didn't know that. And he said, you know, my French is not very good either. I didn't know that. I got him to his hotel and got him checked in, and I went to the phone in the lobby. And I called Dan Tony and I said, you asshole, this is the wrong guy. He said, what? I said, this isn't the guy. He said, what do you mean? I said, that's not the guy in Belle de Jour. So against my better judgment, I now had as the two leads of this picture, two people that I wasn't crazy about, that I thought were wrong for the part, both of them. However, like many good actors, they fall right into it. They just seem to adjust. I think one of the great charms of the film is what they make of Frog One, because he's far from a conventional baddie. He's the most sophisticated person in the film, really. He's the person you might most like to sit down to dinner with. And Ray makes a great deal of him, I think. The way in which he and Hackman Popeye sort of taunt each other all through the film is really very appealing, I find.